Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about what might be the dumbest plane of World War II, both in the sense that the overall design and concept might have been a little stupid, and in that it bore a stupid name, or nickname in this case, not one assigned to it by the country that made it, but rather by those fighting against them. For this plane, we go back to the summer of 1944 in the Pacific, where we find a desperate Imperial Japan. Gone now was the short-lived dominance of the Japanese military in the area, although if you looked at a map of controlled territory, that may not have been entirely clear. Extending outwards from Japan, the Imperial Japanese still had control over decent swaths of mainland China, Burma, Thailand, French Indochina, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaya, Borneo, the Indies, Japan still held a great deal of territory, but that was rapidly fading away. Already in October 1943, the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, declared the military situation to be grave, and he wasn't wrong. After the Battle of Midway, the tides of the war would slowly begin shifting against Japan. Small Allied victories in areas like Guadalcanal in 1942 would snowball and escalate into full Japanese withdrawal from Guadalcanal in early 1943, the death of Isoroku Yamamoto, further Allied advances in the Solomon Islands, renewed British offenses in Burma, Allied invasions of New Guinea, Saipan, Guam, to put it simply, the massive gains achieved by Japan in late 1941 and early 1942 were increasingly fading away as the war drew on. As the tide of war continued to crash against them, Japan grew increasingly desperate, and at the same time more tactically normal in a sense. For the latter, Japanese ground tactics would shift in the second half of the war. Very early on in the war against China mainly, Japan had relatively decent success utilizing the Banzai Charge, which was effectively an all-out attack, throwing all caution to the wind and just charging at the enemy. Casualties be damned. Against the technologically less advanced Chinese forces, this wasn't a terrible tactic in that China didn't have enough rapid-fire weaponry to really stop them. But against better-equipped American and Allied forces, bonsai charges were rather foolish. While some did work somewhat due to their inherent shock value, America and other more advanced forces could simply let their machine guns go to work against the unprotected soldiers. As the war ground on, the tactic became less and less common, only being used as a last-ditch effort when all hope was lost. In the latter half of the war, Japanese forces became much better at holding their defensive positions at all costs, forcing Allied forces to take their positions inch by inch in a brutal slog of a war. In the air, though, Japan would seemingly adopt the bonsai charge, in a way, as a major strategy in the form of kamikazes. The dominance of planes like the Zero was no more, and Allied fighters were now much better than their Japanese counterparts. Additionally, because of ever-increasing Allied raids on mainland Japan and Japanese manufacturing, Combined with the ever-dwindling vital military resources and personnel, Japan found it increasingly difficult to create new advanced fighters en masse, or fighters and dive bombers that could take out Allied ships. They needed something that was easy to make, easy to fly, hard to hit, and powerful. For this need, Ansign Mitsuo Ota, in conjunction with the University of Tokyo no less, would design a manned, rocket-powered aircraft that would launch itself at Allied ships and positions as a quasi-missile. This is the Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka, also known as the Cherry Blossom, or to the Allies as the Baka Bomb. 
In August 1944, with Japan growing increasingly desperate, Ansign Ota and his co-designers, a group of students from the Aeronautical Research Institute, would submit their idea to the Daiichi Kaigan Koku Gijitsucho, or in English, the Yokosuka Naval Air Technical Arsenal, which was slightly more difficult for me to say for some reason. While Ota had submitted his design the year prior in 1943 and received little interest in it, in the more critical war situation, his proposal received significant interest from the Japanese military. Because his design was very simplistic, nearly a dozen of these manned missiles were built from scratch in just a few weeks' time. Measuring in at just 6 meters long, 5.12 meters wide, and just 1.16 meters tall, the Oka was effectively just three things. A cockpit, a warhead, and some rockets. Because they would need to be built quickly and cheaply for the eventual defense of Japan, the Oka frame would largely be made out of wood and metal that was considered to be non-vital in nature. This, combined with their small size, made the Oka incredibly light when empty at just 970 pounds. Because of the sheer simplicity and small size of the design, it was envisioned that the Oka could be built by even the most unskilled of laborers, to be built by whoever could hold a hammer or a rivet gun. After all, it was to be all hands on deck for Japanese society, with men, women, and children expected to defend the homeland any way they could. The vast majority of the Oka's gross weight would come from the explosive charge and the rocket propulsion. At a gross weight of 4,718 pounds, more than half of that would be a 2,600-pound warhead in the nose. The remainder of that weight would be three Type 4 Mark I Model 20 solid propellant rockets, with 1,764 pounds of thrust per rocket. These rockets would only be able to fire for anywhere between 8 and 10 seconds, though, which will be more important later on. By October 1944, the first initial flight test of an unpowered Oka would take place, and the next month, a powered version would take to the air for the first time. These flight trials would prove to be satisfactory for the Japanese military. It controlled well enough even for a relative novice and in a test in January 1945, its top speed ranged from 288 miles an hour without the rockets up to 403 miles an hour with the rockets at full thrust, up to even 620 miles an hour in an all-out dive. Incredible speeds for such a time. With the military desperate or incredibly confident that the design would be a success, probably a mix of both, mass production of the Oka began before its initial flight tests, and they would be produced first in September 1944, shortly after the initial dozen or so models were made. And by March 1945, 755 of these original Okas, the Model 11, were completed. Running in parallel to the Model 11, in much fewer numbers, was the K-1 trainer variant that swapped out the warhead and rockets for some water ballasts and a landing skid. Just 45 of these were made, though, likely because there probably wasn't much of a point in them being made. The Okas were supposed to be incredibly easy to fly, and they wouldn't be coming back, so there wasn't much of a point in flying and landing practice. Regardless, though, the first Okas would fly into combat on March 21st, 1945. Or, more accurately, they were carried into combat, because they didn't have landing gear or a method of propulsion that lasted more than 10 seconds, the idea was that the Oka would be carried underneath a larger aircraft, like the Mitsubishi G4M, reporting name Betty, as a parasite aircraft. Once within a designated range, the Oka would be released and would glide towards their target. 
However, in its initial combat run, the short thrust time and relatively low thrust power of the three rockets showed itself to be a major problem. Generally speaking, the Okas would be released at around 3,500 meters altitude within 23 miles of their target, as that 23 miles was their maximum range. This short range placed both the Oka and their parent aircraft in severe danger, as that 23 miles was well within the range of even the shortest range Allied interceptor. Thus, when the Okas were first used on March 21st, Allied interceptors discovered the G-4M parent aircraft before they were within 23 miles, forcing the 16 G-4M bombers to release their Okas well before they would be in range, leaving them with no chance to hit their target. While this was a major issue, this didn't completely remove the ability for the Okas to do some damage, though, and on April 1st, 1945, the Okas would score their first recorded hit. Probably. On the initial day of the nearly three-month-long meat grinder that was the invasion and battle of Okinawa, a handful of G-4M parent aircraft apparently slipped through the cracks and successfully launched their Okas within the 23-mile range. One of the Okas aiming at the battleship West Virginia successfully crashed into the deck just in front of a 20mm gun battery, causing a small explosion that killed four and injured another seven. Luckily for the West Virginia, though, the warhead in the Oka failed to detonate in the crash and it was later disarmed. The West Virginia survived and continued to serve through to the end of the war. It also should be noted, though, that it is apparently contested that an Oka actually hit the West Virginia. How exactly that could be contested, I'm not sure. There would be a plane and bomb wedged in the deck. How exactly could you mistake that? Regardless, though, that same day, three other transport vessels were also hit by kamikazes, although it isn't clear that they were hit by Okas or some other kamikaze aircraft. The three transports would survive the attack anyhow. Eleven days later, though, the Okas would score their first confirmed ship kill, when on April 12, 1945, Okas launched from nine G-4Ms hit the destroyer Manor L. Abel, where the warheads would actually detonate this time and split the ship in two, sinking it and killing 84. Two other destroyers, Jeffers and Stanley, were also damaged in the attack, with the Jeffers suffering enough damage that forced it to withdraw, and Stanley suffering a piercing blow to the hull that did little meaningful damage, all things considered. This day was probably the best day that the Okas had and the most damage they would cause. The only other comparable day was on May 11th, when the destroyer Hugh W. Hadley was severely damaged by an Oka, but miraculously managed to stay afloat. However, upon its return to harbor, it was deemed beyond repair and would eventually be scrapped in 1947. Other than these two days, where the Okas effectively took out or repelled three destroyers, the rest of the war saw just a handful of other hits, with no destroyed vessels. Out of the 755 Model 11 Okas made in time for the Okinawa campaign, just 74 of them were believed to have been used in combat. A significant number of this 74 were either destroyed or rendered useless after the destruction of their parent aircraft, and very few hits were recorded. Japan seemed to be well aware of the limitations of the design and concept, and after March 1945, presumably after the Oka's failure on March 21st, Model 11 production was ceased outright. While America did recognize the threat posed by the Okas, and after April 1st, they would take measures to extend their aerial defensive perimeters to take out the parent aircraft, 
Soldiers on the ground seemingly thought that the Oka was pretty dumb, giving it the name of Baka Bomb, Baka meaning stupid in Japanese. Despite the relative failure of the Oka, this wasn't the end of it, though. Recognizing the poor range and vulnerable parent aircraft, improvements to both were proposed. The Model 22 Oka would replace the three rockets with a Su-11 motor jet engine. The parent plane would also be swapped out to a P-1Y-1 Francis bomber. Because the Francis had less underside clearance than the G-4M, the wingspan of the Model 22 had to be reduced. Additionally, because its motor jet engine provided significantly less thrust, the 2,600-pound warhead would be swapped out with a 1,300-pound warhead. 50 of the Model 22 were constructed, and just one recorded test flight of them took place in July 1945, where it went into a stall and crashed. Then there was the Model 33, to be outfitted with an NE-20 turbojet and an 1,800-pound warhead, to be mounted on a G-8N1 Rita. To our knowledge, none of these were ever made, it was just a proposal. Also never made were Models 43A, 43B, and 53, designed to be launched from submarines, caves, and a tow line, respectively. Two other proposed models worth mentioning are Model 21 and the Suzuka 24. The Model 21 would replace the wood wings with steel wings, likely for more penetrative potential. And the Suzuka 24 would replace the warhead with a fuel tank and 20mm cannons. Just one Model 21 was made, and allegedly a handful of Suzuka 24s were made and flown against attacking B-29s, although this has not been confirmed. As a whole, though, the Oka project was a failure that was openly insulted by American forces. Not a great sign that a weapon meant to try and turn the tide of war is called stupid by your enemy. In all honesty, though, I do understand the idea and how something like the Oka may have been more preferable than other options. The two biggest distinguishing factors between the Oka and something like the Ki-115, or a repurposed Zero, for example, was construction cost and speed. The Oka had much greater speed, hypothetically, and would be much harder to take out on its approach. Additionally, the simple frame and complete lack of an engine meant that very little in the way of vital resources were being used. I mean, lives were being lost in their usage, but the military higher-ups probably didn't care much about that. So, late in the war, losing resources and production facilities Engines would be an ever more scarce resource, so making a kamikaze without an engine does make sense. Then you can use the engines on actual fighters and bombers and the like. The thing that killed the Oka was that its range was just too short, and that left it way too vulnerable. I suspect that if the Oka had even a 50 mile range, still not that much in the grand scheme of things, Japan probably would have pumped out thousands of them. The prospect of that is rather terrifying. Thousands of 600 mile an hour manned rockets screaming towards Allied vessels. While they wouldn't have turned the tide of the war, they certainly would have made it more bloody for both sides. So it was better for all involved that the Oka didn't work out and was kind of stupid. All right, and on that note, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I mentioned the Oka previously in my XP-75 video, I believe, as something that could be considered as one of the worst planes of World War II. Give it just a bit more range that can help keep the parent aircraft safe, then I think it could have avoided being in that conversation. I'll just travel back in time and let Japan know. I'll just have to learn Japanese first, and I think time travel will be invented before that happens. 
So anyway though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!